Hi, and welcome to the Digital Digging YouTube channel. I thought I'd do something a little different for a change and tell the story of the creatures from the Black Lagoon. I collected these fossils with a friend of mine, John. That's his real name, actually. John somehow knew where all the best fossil collecting spots were. Perhaps it was something to do with his geology degree, or perhaps it was something to do with the fact that he frequently went looking for them. We had often spent days in odd places, sifting through bits of quarries no one else seemed terribly interested in, and occasionally finding treasures our childhood selves would have goggled at, that we indeed goggled at. But the place he took me to on the day we found the pearlescent Ammonite Mountain was, if not the oddest, then certainly the most unpleasant. Our species is not without the occasional stroke of inventive genius. The internet is an obvious example, as is the paperclip, penicillin, paper, the NHS version 1.0, zips, kebabs, aquariums, the list is virtually endless and, of course, right up there in the top 10 somewhere, includes lists. It also includes our solution to the phenomenon of conspicuous consumption. Do you have too much food, clothing, packaging? Don't worry, we'll dig a big hole, throw it in and then bury it. Problem solved. Oh, you have more, don't worry. We'll never run out of holes. We seem to find them almost everywhere we dig. It's amazing. One drizzly, blustery morning, John and I found ourselves standing in what was formerly some Wiltshire countryside, but was now a vast plain of black Kimmeridge clay, chosen by the authorities as a prime landfill site for its impermeable qualities. This had been divided into cells into which rubbish could be tipped and if something nasty started pooling at the bottom of a cell, instead of leaking out, it would stay there, festering forever. Ironically, this indicates that a great deal of thought had been expended on the consequences of dumping rubbish into holes, but not on how to actually avoid having to dump rubbish into holes in the first place. In the near distance, they were filling a new cell. These cells, it should be noted, are vast. Down there, spreading and compressing new rubbish, weaving between steel pipes that had been hammered into the under-rubbish to release large quantities of gas, were JCB-like vehicles that, from our vantage point, appeared to be the size of Tonka toys. The wheels didn't have tyres, but were instead large lumps of metal with moulded veins to aid traction. The only thing that gave a sense of scale were the flocks of seagulls following these vehicles, swirling in the rudderless winds and perpetually broadcasting in piercing shrieks that here, against all the odds, was another bit of interesting rubbish. But in this wasteland was beauty. Without getting too technical, if you dig a socking great hole, then you have to put all the stuff that isn't whole somewhere else, and it was here that John said we'd find the best fossils. The mountain of clay was, like us, a little unstable and the sides were fairly steep so we couldn't go clambering around too much without causing a slide which, all going badly, would have meant finding out exactly how big those JCB creatures were and also becoming the subject of the latest broadcast on the Seagull News Network. So we measured our pace and spent the morning squinting at a huge pile of clay, looking like the world's most diligent quantity surveyors, I'm guessing that's close to what they do, picking little fossils out of the muck and putting them in little plastic bags. The Jurassic Ammonites were tiny, but a fair number of them were pearlescent, so they stood out against the black clay like so many discarded Victorian buttons. The diminutive, slender Bellum Knight Spears were harder to spot, but the current drizzle and the rain of the day before had given them a slight sheen that separated them from the matte clay in which they sat. In other circumstances, we could have spent the entire day there, but as was so often the case, we brought mild hangovers with us and all too frequently the wind would shift, replacing the local breathable atmosphere with a pocket of noxious, eye-watering, breakfast-threatening gas. This, coupled with the occasional waft of diesel exhaust and the constant noise from the seagulls, brought the search to an early conclusion. Also, I'd found, wrapped in a cocoon of clay, in all likelihood, the carapace of a Jurassic crab. Understandably, I was itching to get home and start uncovering my latest treasure. Now, a mere 12 years later, I'm about to start. Next time, how we spent the hottest day of the year in an exposed quarry trying to carry 70 pound lumps of Jurassic tree trunk to the car park before the gates closed. Right then, cheerio chaps. Don't forget to like this video if you did, and if it really irked you, then feel free to dislike it. If you feel somewhat ambivalent about the whole thing, then you can avoid doing either, or perhaps do both if that's indeed possible. If you'd like to hear more low-key adventuring stories, then be sure to let me know in the comments. Okay, I'll hopefully see you for the next one. Bye-bye.